okay so uh, welcome viewers and uh, today we have as you can see ultimate analysis and uh, the topic itself is very engrossing you know uh, in the ultimate analysis uh, we will take a topic which will be encasing and the method we will follow what you can see is that and you have been sent the links and uh, you can keep asking questions or uh, uh, supplementary questions i can see that live and uh, between our uh, discussion and uh, i'll take uh, all those questions after every 10 to 15 minutes uh, without breaking the rhythm of the class so a topic we have today is as you can see in the thumbnail a constitutional doctrines right so hidden treasure or constitutional morality the topic uh, sounds like uh, we are trying to understand some kind of uh, ethical perspective of the constitution which is not uh, uh, a right way to understand this thing uh, constitutional doctrine means the various uh, regions and principles the ratios basically of the constitution that uh, either explicitly mentioned in the constitution or they have been innovated and involved uh, evolved at the various uh, judgments by the supreme court of india why they are important you know the constitutional doctrines are important because if you know uh, the doctrines uh, you can automatically remember the articles uh, maybe the cases and also uh, you can use them very efficiently uh, in writing uh, descriptive questions, uh, maybe essay or ethics as well, because these principles, when we sound them, they don't look like uh, they are uh, highly legalistic in nature, you know. So you can use them even while daily talk with someone or some a descriptive writing or uh, for a prelims examination, multiple choice questions. So. Uh, uh, these doctrines are very important, uh, specifically for uh, my legal acumen in the constitution and the polity paper which we have. So before we go ahead and take uh, uh, the constitutional doctrines uh, one by one maybe or uh, maybe few of them, uh, let me tell you what uh, number of doctrines and I am not saying that all these names are exhaustive but uh, almost all the doctrines I have tried to collect. Uh, without going into the very microscopic uh, doctrines. So, I have divided the doctrines into three categories, you know. So, three categories, doctrines have been divided. Now, first category is general uh, constitutional doctrines. Second is, of course, related to fundamental rights. And third will the federalism. So, generally, uh, we can divide the various doctrines into the three parts, right? And now, uh, as we can see, the general doctrines which we have like doctrine of pleasure, number one, doctrine of pleasure. Then we have doctrine of harmonious construction. Doctrine of silence. These are the doctrines which are applicable throughout the constitution uh, because they belong to a specific category of issues rather than a particular article. Right. And then we have fundamental rights and this will have the highest number of doctrines here uh, in the fundamental rights thing. Like we have uh, waiver, doctrine of waiver, second doctrine of severability. Then we have doctrine of eclipse. Then we have doctrine of, uh, you can say, a reasonableness. Doctrine of reasonableness. Then we have doctrine of parents patriae. And most of all, we have doctrine of basic structure. 
right and similarly in federalism you have doctrine of uh, colorable legislation doctrine of pith and substance right then we have uh, a doctrine of uh, ancillary ancillary powers and territorial nexus doctrine of territorial nexus and fourth is doctrine of ancillary powers right so these are the general doctrines we need to know and uh, believe me these are uh, common sensical logic because law as it developed since the days of the romans uh, it is about the common sense of the wiser people of the society so these doctrines have been developed to bring uniformity in the interpretation of the constitution why these doctrines are used by supreme court because supreme court uh, has the, uh, the authority and the position as the final interpreter of the constitution and as the final interpreter it is very important for them to make consistency in their interpretation because if they will not make the things consistent then we have doctrine of legitimate expectation in fundamental right right because if the supreme court does not make its decisions uh, consistent predictable then uh, it will not be able to establish any kind of rationality in the jurisprudence and these constitutional principles right from the supreme court lower to the district court uh, they, they they give a uniformity in the decisions of the judges interpretation of the law sounding the judgments and orders and directions whatever they give and equally important role the doctrines play for the supreme court i'm saying is that they uh, give the supreme court uh, special tools special weapons to play the role of guarantor of the constitution guarantor of the fundamental rights right so for two purposes we can say um, roughly uh, their principles are very important uh, as the final interpreter of the constitution supreme court and as the guarantor of fundamental rights now in the next section which is uh, for you maybe more important I, i'll explain all of these doctrines initially in one or two minutes each and then i'll take one doctrine in detail so basically i'll define all of them in a one line or 20 words you can say it's like giving interview if somebody is asking what is doctrine of pleasure you will have to tell okay sir this is what it is so 20 words answer so let's start with the doctrine of pleasure doctrine of pleasure means that many posts in the constitution are subject to pleasure of the president or pleasure of the governor pleasure of the governor like attorney general like the governor these for ministers individual pleasure is uh, the individual responsibility is there civil servants all these things are dependent on the doctrine of pleasure the doctrine of pleasure means when a post is dependent on the pleasure of the president or the governor then the president has the power to appoint as well as remove the person without any other kind of the constitutional uh, conditions if the pleasure doctrine is there so the question you will try to understand here to understand the um, civil services the difference in the pleasure doctrine for governor and the difference in the pleasure doctrine for attorney general and when you read how the doctrine of pleasure differs for these three people attorney governor and civil servants then uh, you will automatically know uh, the difference and importance and many other articles of the constitution by knowing the difference that we will see later second when we go for doctrine of harmonious construction which itself shows by its name that uh, whenever two laws or the rules which are properly passed or articles of the constitution which are there in the constitution or interpretation done by the supreme court which under article 141 becomes law as effect of the law if any two law rules 
uh, seemingly are contradictory to each other. Then doctrine of harmonious construction says there should not be any tendency among judges under judicial review or as a reader, you and me, to jump to conclusion that one provision is right and other provision is wrong because they are seemingly contradictory in nature. The doctrine of harmonious construction is about resolving the seemingly opposite looking, opposite meaning giving articles, laws, uh, rules, bylaws, uh, order uh, in the constitution or uh, in the authority of the law. So resolving contradictions by declaring that both of them somehow are correct is called doctrine of harmonious construction and therefore it is said that uh, wise people uh, don't see in black and white. You have to protect the constitution as it is. For example, if there is a difference in any law between the responsibility of mother and responsibility of the father, then it is so-called violation of Article 14 equality and Article 15 non-discrimination on the basis of sex. Then how can you contradict, um, use harmonious construction to say that? As Supreme Court said, very easy. Mother is not biological mother. Mother. Because mother can also be father if she is the only in charge of the taking care of the child and her economic and other needs. So by saying that, even the mother can be father, Supreme Court solved all the things. That's what harmonious construction means. Harmonious construction means, right. Uh, meanwhile, uh, 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 you may raise whatever doubts and uh, other things you have because I can see all your... Uh, uh, comments and things which are here, right? Now go to the third one, doctrine of silence, very important, very, very important constitutional morality. Supreme Court said in one case, let's not go into details of the case, the case name is anyway Bhanumati versus State of UP 2010. In that Supreme Court said that the basic constitutional nature like democracy, republicanism, secularism, sovereignty, all these things are supposed to be present even if they are not written or mentioned in any law or the provision of the constitution. It means that you don't have to write, I am making Panchayati Raj Act to promote democracy. Or you don't need to write that this is the republican system has to be promoted. But doctrine of silence says even if. There is nowhere mention of the word democracy, republicanism, secularism, sovereignty, etc. Then you have to presume that these are always present by their absence. Their absence. And therefore, if we do something to promote democracy, something to promote democracy, in, 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 in whatever ways we do, you cannot counter that step simply by saying that it is violation of some kind of uh, laws or rules or um, precedent or whatever. Because democracy itself is silently present anywhere, everywhere. The doctrine of silence is principles sometimes are present by their absence. That's how doctrine of silence it means. You don't have to always say that India is a democratic country and we are making Panchayati Raj rules and regulations to promote democracy at grassroots level. No, we don't need to. You have to presume it. And that's what silence means. Now, pith and substance. Uh, colorable legislation. This is here we are coming in federalism. And colorable legislation means very clear. Now, one line definition is no one can make a law which is not allowed to him to be made means any incompetent legislature cannot snatch the competency by masking the law, by changing the words of the law, by changing the title of the law. So what is not allowed to be done directly cannot also be done indirectly. That's what the whole thing is. That's what the whole thing is. Right? So colorable masking is unconstitutional in the list system. Everyone has to follow the sanctity of the lick system. 
Now, pith and substance, that whenever Supreme Court checks whether the law is colorable or not, then Supreme Court will use the doctrine of pith and substance in which they will not see the peripheral or unimportant or title's importance of the law, but they will go for the core and the crux in effect of the law. If the core and substantial effect of the law is on the other list for which your legislature is not competent, then under pith and substance, your doctrine, your law, your authority can be declared unconstitutional. Unconstitutional. Now these two doctrines, territorial nexus and ancillary powers, are like exceptions to colorable legislation. What ancillary power means? Ancillary power means if the law is largely, substantially within the list system, competent for the legislature to make the law, then only superficial, peripheral, incidental, unimportant overflow of the law on the other list items will not make the law unconstitutional. So, incidental impact on the other list will not make the legislative competence within the list system unconstitutional. Right? So, this is ancillary territorial nexus again. You know, under Article 245, extraterritoriality is available only to the Parliament of India, you know, Article 245. But here, territorial nexus says, doctrine says that in some cases, even the state law, for example, state of Delhi is the state, semi-state, state. Law of Delhi can be applicable outside Delhi if, if there is territorial nexus of the event, incident, object, property, which is outside Delhi, on which law is being applied of Delhi, this should not be in general case, but if that thing outside Delhi has direct territorial nexus with something inside Delhi, then Delhi law will not be unconstitutional for being effective on other territories, thing, object or, or issues. So, if the territorial nexus of the object outside the state and the law inside the state is clear and direct, then even the state law may have extraterritorial nexus. You know, extraterritorial nexus. Then let's come to this uh, waiver. You can't waive your fundamental rights. That's what it means. That fundamental rights are Supreme Court says social gift man. You can't say, oh, why are you, I mean, um, uh, giving this law to me, I don't need, I'm happy without it. You can't say you don't need untouchability fundamental right. You can't say you don't need, um, you can say what, a right to life or personal liberty. Fundamental rights cannot be wished to be absent in your life. Nobody can waive fundamental rights. Exercise of fundamental rights may be yours twice. But waiving fundamental rights is not your choice. And therefore, you have right to live. You don't have right to die. And that's what it means that right to waiver. Uh, when we will come a bit in detail or as you raise the questions from here and there, we can talk on that. And uh, not to tell you, very soon we will um, apply and we will meet in the larger one-to-one uh, -one kind of thing. Uh, to discuss all these things and other your queries, whatever you have, because this ultimate analysis which we are starting is a continuous process. It's not that in one hour or something which we will talk together. After that, uh, we will never connect on this topic again. Uh, GS score is planning and I, uh, myself, RP Singh, will always be there to connect with you on various issues related to polity and constitution through institutional manner. Uh, this, this life class, 
along with the two way communication through messages and chats uh, we will also have a present meet kind of thing where we can those who are in delhi or those who can come for this polity topic or anything else that we can talk on that you know that's what we will do so waiver severability cut it if something is unconstitutional because it is violating fundamental rights then it has to be cut into pieces which piece is violating fundamental right has to be separated if it is separable so the law which is violating fundamental rights can be cut into pieces and only one two three piece is violating fundamental right so only that severed part shall be declared unconstitutional and rest of the parts of the law if the alone can still be effective on its on their own standing forgetting the severed part then that law will allowed to be existing so severe the law not entire law but if you can't severe the law an entire law shall be declared unconstitutional so when a supreme court finds certain provisions of the law unconstitutional uh, then uh, uh, they will always uh, go for uh, checking the law that which part section subsection is actually violating how much it is connected with the non violating part of the constitution and all and so they will declare it now eclipse that uh, the constitution after coming into existence on the 26th june 1950 fully uh, it eclipsed all pre constitutional laws who, which were in the violation of the fundamental rights so badalon ki tarah dhak lena it is like eclipsing the sun you know so like law is there but it has been eclipsed for those people who have fundamental rights and therefore doctrine of eclipse does not follow for those people who don't have fundamental rights and this is one of the basic differences between severability and eclipse right go to a reasonableness that article 14 reasonable classification and article 19 are reasonable uh, restrictions two words are given and where supreme court said that uh, when you restrict fundamental rights under article 19 or classify two people into different categories uh, into article 14 then you must follow the doctrine and principle of reasonableness so tarkik hona chahiye it has to be yukti yukt that's what we call in hindi so it should be uh, tarkik in nature you know tarkik in nature so this is how uh, it is uh, parents patriae charan lal sahu case that is bhopal gas and after simple very simply understand parents patriae jiska mai baap koi nahi uska kendra sarkar samprabhu sakti hone ke nate hoga thing is that parent t hata diya hai silent t so doctrine of parents patriae simply says that ultimately if nobody else then central government will be accountable and responsible for anything untowards that is happening in india to anyone that's what doctrine of parents patria means the government cannot say oh i don't know i want don't want to do if responsibility is of no one else then it responsibility of the government uh, that's what state zimmedar hoga and this is what is applied somewhere in the matters of compensation accidents damages natural disasters and, and something like that industrial disasters like bhopal gas so these things are very important here to understand then basic structure that we will take in detail first so let's stop uh, don't do right now a legitimate expectation article 14 no that's what it is very clear and what it means that uh, it is necessary that every citizen uh, must get what they legitimately expect in the political social economic system what do you legitimately expect you legitimately expect that if you are a graduate and within the age bracket of giving upsc you must not be prevented from giving upsc examination that is a totally legitimate expectation it is like the person who uh, came first in the 100 meters running he must legitimately expect to get the gold medal. You cannot justify giving the person who came first in a 100 meters race to get a bronze. 
because it is totally against the legitimate expectation. The doctrine of legitimate expectation in Article 14, which is the basis of administrative law, uh, is like uh, 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 jiski jo legally logical ummid hai sarkar se, system se, law se, uh, office mein, department mein has to be fulfilled. So your, your expectation is legitimate, you will get it. That's how the legitimate expectation means. So friend, uh, friends, this was a summary of uh, uh, basically what we did about the various doctrines of the constitution. Now let's go into the uh, another uh, issue. Again, go back to the original topic that why we are discussing it, you know. We are discussing it because we are trying to find out the uh, morality in the constitution. And what is morality in the constitution? Morality of the constitution is going beyond the words of constitution to provide to provide people of India the goals and values mentioned in preamble of the constitution. See the preamble. India is socialist secular democratic republic, sovereign socialist secular democratic republic. Liberty, equality, justice, fraternity and dignity. So, these are the basic constitutional ethical values, but they must not be interpreted in a very static manner. And until we have some evolving morality, it will not be possible to establish the uh, higher goals of constitution increasingly into the life of the people. So constitutional morality is uh, trying to give more and more to the people by applying newer and newer principles of justice. And that's what these doctrines becomes important. Doctrine become important. Right. So constitutional morality is going beyond the ordinary interpretation of the constitution and give some more powerful, some more just, some more human right oriented, some more environmental right oriented uh, interpretation of the fundamental rights and other provisions of the constitution, other provisions of the constitution. So friends, uh, uh, this was about uh, understanding the both micro and macro nature of the Indian constitution. Now. Uh, after all this, let's take one basic structure, one uh, constitutional principle only right now. That is the doctrine of basic structure. And uh, maybe that will make the things clearer to you that how far these doctrines has impact, have impacted the morality in the constitution. So doctrine of basic structure. And we know very well uh, those people who are a fan of facts and want always to write something, I'll give that uh, there are few cases we need to know. And without burdening you with something excessive, I will mention only four Shankari case. Then we have Golaknath. Then we have Keshwanand. Then we have uh, Minerva Mills, 1980, 1973, 1967, 1952. So what happened? Now please understand very clearly. When American constitution was made long back, why I'm talking about American constitution is that Indian Supreme Court is patterned upon the American Supreme Court. It is very well compared there. There was no provision of judicial review inbuilt in the constitution of US. There was a huge dilemma that how to control, how to ensure that checks and balances can also be imposed by judiciary. Judiciary is part of the government, third wing. Executive, legislature, judiciary. And therefore, if there is no power of judicial review, 
and only there is a power of appellate jurisdiction or something like that or original jurisdiction then the ability of the court to play systemic role in balancing the constitution will either be nil or be ineffective or be ineffective right so chief justice marshall in 1804 marbury versus madison case he innovated the doctrine of judicial review he said very simply that uh, supreme court has inherent power of judicial review you know judicial review i don't have to tell you but those who are wondering what exactly means judicial review is that the ability of the highest judiciary to review any law made by parliament or the executive executive uh, is scrutinized for violation of constitution and this power cannot be given to either legislature or the executive because that will violate the principle of natural justice uh, natural justice right and so therefore uh, judiciary as a third empire was made part of the government part of the government so judiciary to play the role of a balancer as well as one part of separation of power principle doctrine it has to be totally it has to be totally in in the uh, game itself and the game will start only when the judiciary has the power of review judicial review so marbury versus madison 1804 chief justice marshall innovated it but in indian constitution it was directly written in article 13 sub clause 2 and what 13 sub clause 2 says any law which is in consistent with this part of the constitution means inconsistent with fundamental rights shall be declared null and void it means two things that post independent laws should not violate inconsistent fundamental rights and power to judge them whether they are violating the constitution or not violating the fundamental rights or not shall rest with the judiciary therefore power of judicial review is directly product of article 13 sub clause 2 but power of judicial review itself is based on certain things like suppose i am a judge and you are bringing a law that sir please check this law violates constitution or not now indian constitution has roughly 450 articles so if i am a judge and you are saying it is violating constitution you please check so i'll check okay this is the law is it violating article number 1 article number 2 article number 3 article number 4 to 450 if it is violating any of the articles especially fundamental rights then the law is unconstitutional but see the case in us there is only seven article all those articles are, are generally broadly mentioned no specific powers like indian constitution so how a supreme court judge in us will check the constitutional validity of any law because basically those seven articles are never violated but still there is judicial review so american supreme court had to go beyond only those seven articles to review so they have to presume that what could be the logical structure of the constitution if article 1 is expanded will it lead to the same law which is under the allegation for the violation of the constitution in this sense you can say that american supreme court has much wider in built power for judicial review than indian constitution and this was true why i am saying this was true because this was true until case one and the bharti case basic structure doctrine so in this case case one and the supreme court came the basic structure what does it mean basically it means that see the parliament can do anything while amending the constitution but in amending the constitution they cannot change the basic structure 
so there is on one side judicial review and on the higher side of judicial review there is doctrine of basic structure and it means very simply that law made by parliament is divided into two parts that is ordinary law special law ordinary law is legislation other than amendment and here is article 368 368 supreme court said what is means basic structure if a law made by parliament is challenged not amendment law but only ordinary law like narega like rti like information technology act see the sriya single case Two thousand fifteen, section sixty-six A of IT Act, two thousand was challenged. Which category it will belong? क्या मांग करा सिया सिंगल ने? सिया सिंगल said, sir, Supreme Court को बोला, sir, please see this section. It is violating the Constitution. It is violating fundamental right. So. It comes under this category, ordinary, ordinary, right? Now, if there is amendment of the constitution, 99th amendment act, 42nd amendment act, you know, like NJSC, this was 31C, taking the symbolic examples. When the Supreme Court goes for judicial review of an amendment law, only amendment law, then Keshwananda said, man, I will check you, not on the basis of violation of constitution alone, but I will also check you for the violation of basic. Now, you can say, sir, how does it matter? It matters, matters a lot. Why? As I told you earlier, violation of constitution is very fixed you have to tell sir it violates article 21 because those articles are written but when you blame any amendment law for the violation of basic structure then the supreme court always have the infinite scope to create a new basic structure like you know in NJSC case, Supreme Court said that oh, judicial independence is basic structure. Hence, 99th Amendment Act and NJSC Act both are unconstitutional. So, basic structure doctrine provides the unlimited power to the judiciary for judicial review of what? Only special law means amendment law under article 368. Basic structure doctrine can never be used against any other law or executive order under the judicial review. Under judicial review. This is what the whole thing is. So, so why this is so famous? Why there is such a contradictory view on, on, on this doctrine of basic structure? It is very simple, friends. Very simple. Please understand that on the one hand, doctrine of basic structure, case one and the case, balanced between Golaknath case and Sankari Prasad case. In Sankari, balance was missing. In Golak, again, balance was missing. How does it so? Because these two articles, these two judgments were given strictly on the interpretation of the provisions of constitution. Though in totally diametrically opposite view, but both the cases were symptomatic of ordinary interpretation of the constitution, literal interpretation of the constitution. So, in Sankari Prasad case, Supreme Court said, oh, 
368 is also a law, but a special law. Hence, if that special law violates fundamental rights, then they cannot be questioned. It means the balance was disbalanced. How? Now the parliament under 368 was given unlimited power by the Sankri Prasad judgment to amend the, any part of the constitution including fundamental rights. The question is if the parliament by its two-third majority can amend the constitution, delete the fundamental rights, can it be said to be a right vision for the constitution, governance and progress and development? The debate was there. But now the verdict was in the favor of the wisdom of the parliament. But practically, wisdom of the parliament is always wisdom of the morality. Parliament kaya bhi? Parliament majority pe chalti hai. So kitna bhi hum bolein, kya re bala takla wisdom hai bhai parliament ka. Parliament is the sanctimonious, you know, kind of thing. They make the law and law is supreme. Fair, fair. We are all law-abiding citizens, we will. But the parliamentary wisdom, which has the highest and unprecedented value in the British parliamentary system, cannot be said to be beyond its shortcomings. And what is that shortcoming? That shortcoming is majoritarianism. So if a PM in India has two-third majority, they can amend any part of the constitution, including the federal principles, with 15 of the states passing them with simple majority. Will it be allowed? Can the constitution be allowed to be changed just because you have majority? That's why Alexis de Tocqueville long back. That's why conservatives in England long back. They said, man, the biggest drawback of democracy is the fear of majoritarianism. Fear of majoritarianism. So, wisdom of the parliament has to be accepted. I'm not denying. But then, it cannot be said that parliament, whatever it does, is always beyond the question. So, here, Sankari Prasad, why tere ko koi question na kar Nobody is questioning the parliament. You do, please, man, whatever you do. So, the fundamental rights of the people were left on the mercy of the parliament. That's what we finally saw. Happened. M.K. Gopalan case, very conservative narrow view. Sankari Prasad, conservative narrow view. But things changed. Again, Golaknath, simple interpretation again, but just opposite to Sankari. What they said here? They said here is very clearly, see, 368 law, which is special law, but it is part of and will be included in Article 13.2. Means even the amendment law cannot change the fundamental rights. And Sankari did not stop there. Sankari went for a doctrine of prospective overruling in fundamental rights. Prospective overruling. And what is this prospective overruling? The judges were Justice Chief Justice Subara was so pissed off with the tendency of the parliament to delete fundamental rights, to tweak fundamental rights. Then he said in doctrine of prospective overruling, Let's see you parliamentarians under Article 368. I'm telling you today, just to Subbarao said, after today, any amendment done adversely in fundamental rights is declared null and white today itself. All the future amendments of fundamental rights were declared zero by Subbarao in 1967 itself. Prospective overruling. The future I am overrule the future. Let's go I am overrule the future for you. Sankari said you do anything. Golaknath case, you can't do anything. Both are these two extremes depending on the simple interpretation. And simple interpretation may not work in a dynamic situation. So this also ended the balance. This also ended the balance. This said judiciary is everything. This said parliament is everything. This is not a balance. This is not a balance. So what is the balance, man? What is the balance? Then came Keshwa case. 
and how it is a balance. Though uh, many people, like Vice President Dhankar, recently said in Rajya Sabha as the chairman of Rajya Sabha, oh, doctrine of basic structure is actually um, a bad doctrine. He said, officially he said, officially law minister you have said, the debate has arisen in India. And what is this debate? We will come later. But let's understand what balance it created in the case. The balance is clear here. And what is the balance? He said, see very carefully, Sankari, parliament can do anything under 368, even if it adversely impacts the FAR. Golaknath said, parliament can never do anything against fundamental rights. Keswa said, you both are correct. In principle, Sankari is correct that they can't. They can do whatever they want. So, Sankari Prasad, judgment, part number one. There is no limitation on the constituent power of the parliament. What is this? This is confirmation of Sankari Prasad. Then Supreme Court continued in Keshwa case. Parliament has no limitation on its constituent power of the um, uh, 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 on the amendment of the constitution. They can do anything, but but they cannot amend. They cannot amend basic structure of the constitution. So basic structure is unamendable beyond the majority of the parliament. Even if a PM has 543 Lok Sabha members, single party, Rajya Sabha, all people, single party, 100% majority, still they can't change, check, delete basic structure. So basic structure, unamendable, is Golaknath prospective over ruling? And there is no limitation on the power of the parliament 368 in itself, is Sankari. Therefore, Keswa is the balance. Balance between not only these two articles, Theradho 368. Balance is also between parliamentary supremacy, sovereignty and judicial supremacy. Judicial supremacy. We are not stopping you. Do what you have to do. Just leave the basic structure in the Keswananda case. Justice Sikri said very clearly. Amending power of the parliament is not the power to make a new constitution. The parliament is not a constituent assembly. Amendment is totally within the reach and authority of the parliament, but amendment should not be used to create a new constitution. New constitution. Right? So on this issue, we will meet again. Again, I told you all our listeners or viewers that uh, um, for, uh, uh, we will meet personally maybe somewhere around 2021 and uh, we can discuss again in person and in person means this laptop is always there link will also be there for that meeting those who can't come can come online but we will do this again and this exercise will uh, uh, keep on going you know keep on going right so uh, the balance was restored. Balance was restored. But again, the balance was questioned again and again. What is the impact of this doctrine of basic structure? Two or three. A second. Number one, that basic structure doctrine allowed the Supreme Court, now go back to the doctrine's hidden treasures, to create new judicial principles to protect and promote the social justice, political justice and economic justice in India. The Adhar judgment, Putta Swami judgment, Supreme Court said, okay, the, so right to privacy is a fundamental right. Now, judicial independence is basic structure. 
Sir Bombay case, secularism is basic structure. You know, Mindarwa Mills case and Keshwananda case, rule of law, republicanism, non discrimination, uh, democracy, federalist structure, all these have been declared a uh, basic structure. What is the beautiful point of the basic structure? There is no list of basic structure. Basic structure are evolving in nature. Means Supreme Court always has this complacency that tomorrow if I need to create something new, which in their wisdom is necessary for the fundamental rights and development of the people of India, they are not bound only by the articles of the constitution because basic structure is judicial innovation. It is such an innovation that like a capital good in economy, it further creates the innovation. So it provides Supreme Court unlimited power and scope of judicial review only in the cases of amendment of constitution. But you know very well that only amendment can change the basic structure, not any ordinary parliamentary law. because. Basic structure of the constitution means the inherent strong pillars of the constitution that can be damaged only by amendment, not by passing any ordinary law. And therefore, basic structure applies only for the amendment will of the constitution. Constitution. Right. So, with this uh, uh, thing, we need to understand that Keshwa established a balanced doctrine of basic structure. Now it is said, President Dhankar said, that basic structure gives judiciary a self-aggrandizement in the name of balancing, in the name of separation of power, in the name of balance of power, in the name of checks and balances, actually judiciary has, a, has gone for the self-increment, self-increment, because in the name of judicial independence, they protected collegium system. Despite Supreme Court accepted that collegium is not without flaws. But at the same time they said the collegium will stay. And they declared NJAC and 99th Amendment Act unconstitutional. So basic structure, invisible, unknown, what will come tomorrow nobody knows. Even wisdom of the parliament is questionable. Even half of the state legislature's wisdom questionable, just because seven judge bench, five judge bench, thirteen judge bench means thirteen people think judges think that it is violation of basic structure. What is the principle behind determination of basic structure? Nothing. It's very subjective, and that's where the problem is. That's where the problem lies. Okay, so questions you may keep, uh, I, I told you we will meet again, uh, uh, maybe on 20th or 21st of this month only, uh, on the same topic. Think on it, what I am saying, and I am taking only basic structure. So why we are going for this is that, when I say constitutional doctrines are hidden treasures, you can understand that so many things are there. So what, all answers you can write well, any question on amendment of the constitution, then you have basic structure. Any question on Article 13.2, you have basic structure. Any question whether fundamental rights are amendable, basic structure. Any question, what is the constituent power of the parliament, basic structure. Any question on basic structure itself will involve the doctrine of basic structure. And the cases, individually, specifically Keshwa, Minerva Mills or in retro sense, Golaknath as well. Why have written Minerva Mills here? Because 42nd amendment was done in 1976, in between 73 and 80. To nullify the impact of Keswa case, basic structure ko hatane ke liye. Minerva Mills case mein Supreme Court ne phir bola, dek bhai, ye basic structure doctrine jaye ga nahi. Ye jaha hai wahi rahega. 
and Supreme Court said again in Minerva Mills case that doctrine of basic structure innovated in Kesava case perfectly fine doctrine and we conform it. It is the ratio of the judgments and with this uh, the doctrine of basic structure became judicial precedent. Minerva Mills case is famous because it confirmed it. Because it confirmed it. What confirmed? Confirmed the basic structure. So there is, uh, even if there was any possibility in the mind of anywhere, anyone, that basic structure is maybe Supreme Court went overboard. But Mindrava Mill said, no, we are fine. And with this came entirely a new thing in Indian judicial system. You know what happened after that? Judicial activism. And you should not be surprised that 1980s and 1990s are the golden years of judicial activism in India. And this Golaknath case itself is the virtual beginning of activism. Court took a U-turn, said no, you can't. Here, innovation, basic structure. Here, AT, it will stay. Now the Supreme Court was becoming active in almost every area of legislation. They were no more shy. They were no more conservative. Judges were now active. Judiciary was now pro-people, pro-problems, pro-justice. And judiciary decided that uh, we can't play this role simply by sitting at fence. And judiciary becoming active in giving justice to the people. Socio-economic, political is called judicial activism. So, basic structure doctrine is the perfect example of the ethics of judicial activism in India. No? All the doctrines are there, but this is something beautiful. More famous, you know, always know. All of you must be knowing, I'm sure. Few hundred people are here, online, offline. Oh. Uh, I'm sure all of you must be knowing basic structure. But the gravity of this doctrine, I'm sure you must be learning now. Must be learning now. So with this, uh, it became an judicial activism. And my God, Supreme Court became confident everywhere. Environmental jurisprudence. M.C. Mehta case and series of that. Series of that. Human rights cases starting from um, you know, Hussein Ara Khatun and going to Bandhuwa Mukti Morcha, Sunil Batra case, DK Basu case, Mathura rape case, my God, so many cases for human rights. And when activism started, Supreme Court utilized the basic structure, extraordinary jurisdiction of its own under Article 142 to maximize the uh, democratic liberal regime in India. Democratic liberal regime in India. We can say that judiciary is not without corruption. True. We can also say that uh, judges may not be also without loopholes. True. Maybe, maybe. We also can say that collegium is bad. Maybe. But at the same time, none of these problems have solution of allowing the political interference in day-to-day -day or substantial issue in the Indian judiciary, specifically the constitutional courts of India. Problem to hai suraksha ki. Lekin uske liye aap share appoint nahi karenge na. So the issue is that political interference in judiciary, even if judiciary has certain flaws, uh, may not be acceptable at all because we don't want too much centralization of power in the executive, a ruling party PM, 
controlling parliament, controlling government, has 100% control over budget, also controls judiciary. What will be left in India then? But then, at the same time, judges, judiciary, collegium, they must be transparent, open, objective, and committed to people. Kaise hoga? Wo ekala ka question hai. Uske baare mein des vichar kar raha hai. People are thinking over it. People are thinking over it. Right. So friends, this was a, a bit of, I have not said ki, uh, doctrine of basic structure is there. Now, before we end, uh, uh, let me tell you that these doctrines uh, have very clearly fixed articles of the constitution. Example deta hum hai, doctrine of pleasure of president. No, just pleasure of president. Attorney general, governor and civil servants. Attorney General 76, Article 76. Right. Governor 156, five years tenure, subject to pleasure of president. And finally, 311 civil servants. But do you understand that? Other than the three articles of the pleasure, these all three pleasure doctrines are applied by the Supreme Court differently in all the three cases. Supreme Court said. That in the case of Attorney General, doctrine of pleasure of president is absolute. Means, the Attorney General is the lawyer and central government is the client. And if the client is not happy, not on the same page with the lawyer, lawyer have to go, a new lawyer will come. Because you can't expect a lawyer who is not on the same page with the client to defend the client. Very simple natural justice principles, therefore. Whenever PM resigns, new government comes, new, new, new Lok Sabha election comes, whatever, the Attorney General simply resigns, a new Attorney General comes into picture. And so you can't say that, oh, kyu hata diya? Nahi, wo cheez yaha pa nahi pooch sakte. Absolute pleasure. But Supreme Court said, you know, in BP Singhal case 2010, many other cases before it, that the position of governor and position of attorney general, even if both contain doctrine of pleasure of president, is not the same. Governor is the constitutional, very important post, not, a, not an unimportant. He is head of the state executive. And therefore, you can't treat him like the attorney general. And therefore, in BP single case, Supreme Court said that any whimsical, capricious, malafied, you know, politically motivated, removal, termination of the governor before the tenure of the five years, subject to pleasure of president doctrine, may be unconstitutional because only for political and ideological differences, a governor cannot be removed. Attorney could be removed, not the governor, because governor is the constitutional post, it's not dignity, hai and therefore, there has to be, Supreme Court said, a very substantial ground on which the doctrine of pleasure of president shall be utilized by the president. President. Right? And similarly, in civil servants case 311, it is there. And it is said that uh, before a president uses doctrine of pleasure to remove a civil servant from his post, then there has to be a proper disciplinary inquiry by the competent authority. And the doctrine of pleasure shall be used according to the disciplinary authority subject to judicial review. That is pleasure. That is pleasure. And that's what comes the constitutional protection to the civil servants in India. Article 311 of the constitution. Now you know that the same doctrine so friends, as I told you, uh, we will meet again. Uh, let's uh, stop here. And thanks for raising so many questions. We have uh, taken note of that. And as I told you that we will meet again somewhere around 20 or 21. You will get the things. And we will talk in person as well, as well as through this. Hope you all learn something, you know, something today, something new, something more engaging. Uh, I hope all of you come up with the new questions and contents. Thank you. Thank you very much.